This sermon uh, this morning uh, is a two-part sermon. I'm going to finish uh, this evening, this morning, most important event in the world, tonight the most important thing in the world. Every once in a while on the news they do a flashback to an important date or event in history and you know, they report on what happened and how this event may still affect us today. The end of World War II, for example, where they kind of go over World War II and what happened, or you know, the first man on the moon, or the 9-11 terrorist attack. And the media will focus on that and go through that and remind us of these things. I've seen a lot of these shows, uh, but despite all of my TV watching, no news or any other program for that matter has ever featured the most significant life-changing event in all the history of mankind. And that is the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, television is polite. Well, <laughs> less so today, but anyways, there was a time that television was polite with the resurrection, treating it as a, you know, a religious festival, but never as a hard fact, never as history. Regardless of what the media says, the resurrection of Jesus remains the single most volatile and important event of our age. More important than any war or political idea or movement or sports story. And it has been important to many people for a long, long time. For example, before there was such a thing as television or the internet or even such a thing as news, the resurrection was important. It was important even before it happened. For example, it was important to the Old Testament prophets who spoke of Christ's resurrection long before He appeared. In Psalm 16, 10, the writer says, for you will not abandon my soul to shell, nor will you allow your Holy One, there's the Holy One, the resurrected one, to undergo decay. It mattered to these people here, this person right here writing thousands of years before Christ, it mattered to them because their hope of life after death rested on this event that they spoke of taking place in the future. It was important to the Jewish leaders who centuries later condemned and conspired to put Jesus to death on a cross. We read in Matthew 27, now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, sir, we remember that when he was still alive, here they're speaking of Jesus, of course, when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. It was important to these people, the resurrection was, in a negative sort of way. They were afraid that the mere teaching of the doctrine of the resurrection, even one that may have been based on a lie, would destroy their religion. It was important to the, um, to the apostles who gave up their lives in order to proclaim their eyewitness account of His resurrection. The apostles saw in the resurrection the proof that his claims about being Lord and Christ were valid. It was what motivated them to face martyrdom without fear. It was important to the Gentiles, in other words, the non-Jews who rejected Christianity for this very fact. In Acts 17, we read, 
Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Here uh, uh, Paul is, is talking to the Greeks, uh, the Greek scholars. And he says to them, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. The Jews, they stumbled, meaning they stopped short of believing. They stumbled at the fact that Jesus was crucified. They couldn't accept the idea that their Messiah could be executed by pagans on a Roman cross. The Gentiles, however, they stumbled, stopped short of belief, at the fact of the resurrection. They couldn't accept the possibility of life after death for a human being. This disbelief simply demonstrated that the idea of life after death was very important even to those who didn't believe it. The resurrection was also important to the early Christians. The early Christians were being challenged on this very point. And Paul writes, writes about it to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15 it says, Now if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith also is vain. Paul tells them that their faith and hope rest squarely on the truth of this fact. And their persecution was caused by it. They didn't persecute the early Christians because of their morality because they didn't you know, divorce their wives and you know, because, they, 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 because they, they, they were not drunkards. They didn't persecute Christians because Christians were the ones that were finding little babies that had been left in the open fields to die because the parents didn't want them and Christians were taking them into their homes. They didn't get killed and you know, drug into the, into, the, uh, into the forums to be eaten by lions because they were good people. They killed them because they had the gall to say there's only one God and we know who He is because our Lord has resurrected from the dead and He's going to judge everybody. That's why they killed them. <laughs> Paul tells them that their faith and hope rest squarely on the truth of this fact. If there is no if there is no resurrection, brothers and sisters, you and I are the most foolish of people and we are just wasting our time in this place. 2,000 years later, in the midst of all kinds of doctrines of reincarnation, you know, like Hinduism and New Age and the occult, the resurrection of Jesus still matters. It mattered to them and it matters to us because His resurrection accomplishes three unique things. First of all, the resurrection establishes Jesus as the divine Messiah. Many claim to believe in reincarnation, even that they themselves were alive in some other form. But Christianity proclaims that Jesus returned as Himself. This accomplishment entitles him to be considered as Lord and Christ. I ask you, who else is going to be Lord in this world except the only one who has come back from the dead? Is there anybody else who can be Lord? This was the point of Peter's first sermon on Pentecost Sunday in Acts chapter two, verse 29. He says, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath 
to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Peter said that through the, uh, uh, through the mouth of David the prophet, God promised that he would resurrect the Christ, that this is what the sign would be. How will we know who is the person you sent, Lord? Will he do miracles? Will he say something in particular? How are we going to know for sure? And Peter says the way that God has told us that you will know for sure is that he will raise up his Christ from the dead. That will be the undeniable fact. That will be the clearest image of his will. People were and are looking for a sign from God and the resurrection is the sign from God. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. So Peter claims that this prophecy has come true. He has seen it with his own eyes, the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 33, he continues and he says, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So Peter goes on to explain where he and the other apostles have gotten the power to perform the miracles that they were doing, speaking in tongues at that particular moment. The resurrected Jesus, he says, has empowered them with the Holy Spirit in order to perform signs to confirm that their witness about the risen Christ is true. If not Jesus, then who then has given them this power? That's his argument. And then in verse 36 he says, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain, no doubt about it, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter assures them that by the sign of the resurrection, God has fulfilled the prophecy concerning the Messiah and that Jesus is that Christ, He is that Lord, He is the divine Savior. All this said to confirm that it is through the resurrection that Jesus is declared and proven to be the Son of God, the divine Messiah and Savior of the world. Another reason why the resurrection is important. First of all, it demonstrates that Jesus is the divine Messiah. How do I know He's the divine Messiah? Because God said He would resurrect from the dead the one He would send. Another reason why the resurrection is important. The resurrection produces faith. We can demonstrate that the Bible, for example, is an inspired book and a revelation from God. I mean, through the accuracy of the prophecy, through the harmony of complex material, the superiority of thought that it has. You know, we, we have all kinds of apologetic material to demonstrate and prove that the Bible is not just any book, that it really is an inspired book from God. But I want you to notice something. Notice that Jesus did not send His apostles out to convince the world according to the accuracy and the harmony and the superiority of the scriptures. Peter didn't get up on Pentecost Sunday and make an argument for the fact that the, the scriptures were from God. That, that wasn't his argument. No, he sent them out to proclaim the eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. That was the point. You see, brothers and sisters, Doubters and disbelievers are not persuaded by logical arguments about God's word. They are persuaded by God's power as seen in the resurrection. Prophecy, accuracy of scripture, superiority of thought may make you believe that the Bible is a special book, but that in itself will not save your soul. A lot of people believe that the Bible is special. I remember when I was 
in Montreal taking some you know, additional college courses, uh, graduate work in, in, in theology and in, in ethics, and the professor who was there, um, uh, um, you know, P, double PhD, he, he spoke uh, fluently in Hebrew, he read from the Hebrew Bible, he read from the Greek, but you know, he academically well qualified. But he, he thought the Bible was just you know, literature. For him it was just literature, nothing, nothing more. You know, the idea is God didn't, doesn't send us out to prove that the Bible is inspired. He sends us out to declare that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. As I say, a lot of people believe that the Bible is special. It's the faith in Christ as the Son of God produced by the witness of the resurrection, recorded in the Bible, that saves a person from hell. Not simply the belief that the Bible is from God. Without the resurrection, this is not possible. Faith is not possible. Another reason. The resurrection is important because it eliminates man's greatest fear, death, death. In Hebrews chapter two, the writer says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, referring to Christ, he himself likewise also partook of the same, meaning Jesus became human, all right? that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. From the fall of Adam, this has been man's greatest fear. People are afraid to die. <laughs> Everywhere we look around us, we see death. The flowers are coming up in the spring, but pretty soon those flowers are going to die and a nice big oak tree in your backyard stays there for 40 years or whatever, but eventually that oak tree is going to give away and it's just going to die. And grandpa is great and we love grandpa and great grandpa and he, great grandpa's got a lot of energy. Boy, he's, he's, he runs around like a 30 year old, but grandpa's going to die. Everybody dies. People give themselves over to this world and to sin and are discouraged in the doing of what is good and right because they believe in death's final power. They think this is all there is. So they might as well live it up. They might as well suck it up because that's all there is, is this. In 1 Corinthians 15, however, Paul says, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immor uh, immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. What victory? A resurrection victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul describes the final victory of the Christian. The victory over death made possible, how? By the resurrection of Jesus. Now some may ask, well how does Christ's resurrection destroy the fear of death in me? And the answer? The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates in a dramatic fashion that death is not final that it can be overcome and that the one who defeated death can also give to others the same power. John chapter six, Jesus himself says, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Why are people afraid of dying? They're afraid of dying because their faith in Christ is either non-existent or weak. That's why. 
You who believe, if you say I believe and you are afraid of death, it means that your faith is weak. I, I, I'm, I'm not you know, harassing you here. I'm diagnosing you. You don't get mad at Dr. Carey, do you, when you go see him and he says, well, you got a thing over here. You don't get mad at him for pointing out you know, your blood pressure is too high or whatever. Well, this is a spiritual diagnosis. The more you are afraid of dying is a sign of how weak your faith is. The great promise of the gospel is that for all of those who believe in Jesus Christ, personal resurrection from the dead will be a reality for them in the same way that it was a reality for Jesus Christ. Jesus won his victory over death on Calvary. The, the, the scene of our victory is in the water of baptism. We die with Christ in the waters of baptism. We resurrect with Christ from the waters of baptism, Romans 6. God requires faith, but not blind faith. He promises us that there is a life after this life, and He has provided the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the once for all proof that this is so. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. So the resurrection's important, the most important event because it establishes Jesus as divine and it generates saving faith and it provides us with hope for eternal life. You know, it's the most, I know maybe your team, you know, if your team wins the NBA, good for you, but that will not help you to raise from the dead. You know what I'm saying? As far as important things are concerned, that you pay off your mortgage, that's an important thing, but paying off your mortgage is not going to contribute to you being raised from the dead. Believing in Christ, that contributes to your resurrection. So when I say I believe. What exactly, what exactly am I saying? You know, those here today, those of you who believe in the resurrection say amen. 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 I think there are a couple of voices I didn't hear. We'll be, we'll be taking names later. When you say you believe in the resurrection, what exactly are you saying according to the Bible? Well, first of all, what you're saying is the resurrection is historical, not allegorical. In other words, despite what TV says, you are saying the resurrection is a historical fact. In Acts chapter four, Peter, Peter says, or Luke writes, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you that to, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Here Peter was talking to the leaders, uh, the Jewish leaders, and they were asking him, you know, what are you doing? How did this man, you know, uh, how did you do this miracle? And so before the Sanhedrin facing punishment, even death, the apostles maintained that they saw Jesus resurrect from the dead. In other words, it was a fact. We don't just believe it, we believe it's a fact. That's, that's very important. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses three, Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all as to one untimely born, 
he appeared to me also. And so the, the early missionaries claimed to have seen the actual Jesus return from the dead. He wasn't a zombie, he wasn't a hallucination, he was a real person with all of his faculties intact. We read in the New Testament that he ate, he spoke, he prayed, he taught them all after his resurrection. So when I say I believe Jesus rose from the dead, I repeat the witness of the apostles that this was a historical event, not a vision, not a dream. What do we believe? So what are we saying when we say, and when we say we believe the resurrection? Well, we, we say the resurrection is, his, is a historical event. We also say His was the first of many resurrections. Again, back to 1 Corinthians 15. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. So the resurrection has significance for us only in the fact that it points to our own resurrection. Otherwise, why would it give us joy or hope? I mean, think about it for a second. If the resurrection of Jesus was just that, you know, like, Jesus didn't say, you're going you're to resurrect like I resurrected. It was just, He resurrected. Well, good for Him. Well, that's an amazing religious thing. I'm glad for Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he, he rose from the dead. Wow, how about that? I wish I could do that. Who would care? Who would, who would give up their life? Who would be a martyr for such an idea? No, 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 the important thing is his resurrection points to my resurrection. That's the significance of it. That's the importance of it. Jesus' resurrection is only a joyful thing for me because it is a preview of my own resurrection one day. He merely shows me that it is possible. Oh, I flipped the thing around. Let's flip it around, shall we? Let's say uh, he dies on the cross, so he pays the price for our sins, okay? And then straight to heaven. I don't want to hang around with these people anymore. 40 more days with these people. You know, I've had enough of these people. I just want to go back to the Father. He's back to the Father in, 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 in heaven. And all he does is he sends an angel and the angel tells Peter, hey, tell everybody if they believe they're going to raise from the dead one day. How many of you would be here this morning if that was the promise, if that was the gospel message? Not too many, I don't think. When I say that I believe that the resurrection of Jesus in the past is a fact of history, I am saying that I believe that my own resurrection in the future is also a fact, Amen. not wishful thinking. And it is a sure fact at that, because he who raised Jesus can and will also raise me. What does Paul say? Romans 8. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. He even explains the mechanics of how it'll happen. You confess Christ, repent of your sins, you're buried in the waters of baptism. What, is, what does Acts 2.38 say? Your sins are forgiven and what else do you receive? The gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Because that indwelling spirit is going to raise your body. There's the power that will raise you from the dead when the time comes. Every time I take communion, therefore, I express and confirm this belief. Every time I neglect communion, I also ignore the opportunity to express my own hope. To deny Jesus' resurrection is to deny the possibility of our own resurrection. To say that His was just a vision or a ghost or a hallucination is to assign this same phenomena to our own resurrection. We cannot attach more of a hope to our future resurrection than we grant to that of God's Son. 
His resurrection, as I said, makes my resurrection possible. So let's summarize, shall we, what we've studied today. The resurrection is the most important event in history and it affects each one of us personally and here is why. The resurrection is what separates Jesus from every other religious leader or prophet in history. Think about it. None of them ever claimed resurrection. Mohammed never said, and I will raise from the dead. The Buddha never claimed that. No, no, nobody, no prophet, no one has ever claimed that they will resurrect from the dead and then completed it. Through the resurrection, God has established Jesus as His only divine Son and Savior of the world. I go back to our original reading in Romans 1.4, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what my faith is anchored on. This right here, this event. Secondly, what have we said? The resurrection is important because it initiates faith. It is the spark by which the flame of our faith is lit. Skeptics and doubters are not convinced by the love of God, but rather by the power of God seen in the resurrection. I can believe what Jesus said and obey what He has commanded me to do because of this powerful and unmistakable sign. I don't know about you, I want to resurrect from the dead. I want to keep going. I don't want the me to be extinguished. That's why I'm not a Buddhist. That's why I'm not a Buddhist. I don't want my whole life to be about extinguishing myself. I want to live. I want to be. I want to exist forever. Is that pride? No. That is hardwired into me because I am made and you are made in the image of God. Anybody who wants to die has not understood or has lost contact with his or her essential nature. Our essential nature is that we are made in the image of God. We don't want to die, we want to live. The hard part is carrying around this old carcass of ours for 80, 90, 100 years, you know, until we are finally released. That's the hard part. The resurrection is important because it gives me real hope that I too will be resurrected one day. Prophets and astrologers and mystics can write all they want to about the other world. People can go on TV and talk about the tunnel or the white light that they have seen in their near-death experiences. But only Jesus actually died and resurrected three days later to show me personally that it is possible and promise the same for me one day. Jesus has the ability to promise me this thing because He has the power over life and death and His resurrection is the unmistakable proof. One more scripture. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again this commandment I received from my Father. This is the Lord I want to follow. This is the person I want to follow. The one who says I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it back up again. This is the guy I want to follow. Our greatest problem is not that we don't know about the resurrection. Our greatest problem is that we don't stake our entire lives on this fact. Because if we did, we would be more eager to tell other people about this fantastic thing, an experience that they could also have. We would start living like people who are going to live forever. 
We'd forget the petty quarrels and worldly worries. We'd give up sinful habits and people. We'd be more careful with our salvation and the salvation of our children and our friends and not take chances. My children are going to live forever. My grandchildren are going to live forever and I'm not going to do anything that will jeopardize that for them. And we would not put off until tomorrow the baptism or the repentance or the restoration that could give us the promise of eternal life today. The resurrection of Jesus, the greatest, most important event in history, but the most important event in your history will be your own resurrection. Make sure that when it happens, that it'll be to the joy and to the glory with Jesus and not to the judgment of disbelief. If you wish to take hold of that promise today and have not done so already, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.